some years ago, when the internet was young, I found a story called Testimony of a Healed Marriage. It's, it's still on the internet on Facebook. And here's how it begins. Have your picture taken on Santa's knee and send it to Becky. These were the words that were spoken to Murray's heart. But was this God really speaking? Maybe it was his flesh, his own desire. After all, it was Christmas time, and he really missed Becky. They had been divorced four months, and he dreaded the holidays without her. However, the words persisted. So Murray went to the mall and found Santa on the lower level, little children on his lap, having pictures taken. Embarrassed, Murray submitted to the ritual, holding a card with Becky's name on it. Santa and his helpers joined in the fun, thinking it a great Christmas present. Would Becky think so, though? After months of no communication, would receiving the picture make her angry? Murray hoped he was being led by the Holy Spirit, but he wasn't sure. He realized now that their marriage was doomed for destruction from the beginning because it had been built on the wrong foundation. A very angry young man, Murray coped with his anchor by drinking, climbing the corporate ladder, and doing drugs. Eventually, he added adultery. Becky prayed until finally losing all hope. She filed for divorce. Devastated, Murray discovered the job he had worked so hard for and made such a priority suddenly meant nothing. So he resigned and moved from Dallas to Tulsa. So except for the Santa Claus thing, this is a story that could be told of thousands of marriages. In our culture for at least 50 years now, marriage has been a non-priority taking a sad second place to personal success and fulfillment. And that's still true, though the terms used for selfishness may have changed from success to self-actualization. The reality that marriage has a second place and passing role in a person's life is still the cultural norm. In fact, today, thousands of couples never even make the marriage commitment, choosing to live together only till taking care of myself do us part. Malachi 2, 10 through 16, is one of the most significant scriptures on faithfulness in marriage and in God's attitude toward that faithfulness. It's a passage intended to correct and shape our hard attitudes, whether we're married or not. As a church and as individuals, it's very easy for us to accept our culture's devaluing of the marriage bond, to allow wrong attitudes toward sexuality and toward divorce to creep into our thinking, quietly giving up God's design for marriage. The church has been on this slippery slope since at least the 1960s. But when we abandon marriage, we also break faith with God. When we are faithful in our marriages, we are also keeping faith with God. Malachi 2, 10 through 16 will remind us that faithfulness in marriage honors God's covenant design. The first few verses indict God, Israel's people for breaking faith with God's ways. Malachi 2, 10 through 12. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. We have one Father, and one God created us. This is one of the rare places in the Old Testament where God is so clearly recognized as Father. And as Father and Creator, God has the sovereign right to tell us what to do. The author of a novel establishes that novel's world and the fate of its characters. In the same way, God, as the author of our lives, has the right to establish how we should live them. 
He often chose to communicate this by covenants, solemn commitments in which God makes promises to us and calls us to allegiance and obedience. But now, Malachi says, God's people have parted ways with the covenant that he gave through Moses, disobeying the covenant commands about marriage and idolatry, or both. This paragraph, taken alone, could be read as one of the places where the worship of other gods is compared to unfaithfulness in marriage. But in this case, I think the accusation is pointing to unfaithfulness to God, not through idolatry, but through disobeying his standards for sexuality and for marriage. I I think that's true for two reasons. First, chronology. Malachi was written well after Israel's return from the Babylonian exile. All the evidence shows that the nation, while struggling with many things, had been forever cured of explicit idolatry by the exile. Second, context. The rest of this section cannot be about anything else but marriages. It makes sense for these first verses then, which are connected seemingly to the rest of the section, would also be about marriage, though with the emphasis on how their marriage behaviors were ultimately unfaithfulness to God as well. The key Hebrew word this morning is faithless, often translated more strongly breaking faith or dealing treacherously. It's used five times in these six verses. And the verb means to deceive. It was used as a participle, meaning one who deceives, the person who deceives. It was used to indicate unfaithfulness in relationships, especially marriage, but also unfaithfulness to the Lord. It was used of breaching man-made treaties and the social responsibilities expected in normal human relationships. So a couple quick examples. The men of Shechem dealt treacherously against their own king, Abimelech. Job felt that his friends were faithless toward him. Jeremiah lamented that in his day the wicked and the treacherous or faithless prospered. So the word is really better translated as dealing treacherously with someone or breaking faith with someone. But it's interesting to me that the same Hebrew root means a garment or a covering. In fact, to cover with a garment in that culture was a covenant act indicating an intention to marry. You you see that in the book of Ruth. And though the word used for garment there is different, the mindset that says, I cover you with my garment to protect you and establish a covenant with you, was present. So for this related word to come to mean breaking faith, it may have have acquired the connotation of uncovering, uncovenanting, leaving unprotected. It's being a traitor to the person you had made this covenant with. The people of Israel, were breaking faith with God's commands by marrying outside God's people, marrying Gentiles. These out-of-covenant marriages were clearly forgiven in Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy 7 and other places. But after Judah returned from the Babylonian exile, these out-of-covenant marriages became common. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah reveal the concern that godly leaders had over this devastating violation of the covenant. Malachi shows that concern and says that anyone who breaks faith with God and God's family in that way is desecrating God's altar with his offerings. He says God himself will cut him off from the tents of Jacob. Point is simple that in the area of marriage, God desires our obedience. We can't take lightly the commands and wisdom of God in this area. One application of the specific teaching is that Christians should marry Christians and not be unequally yoked, in the words of the Apostle Paul. When you're not married yet, it's easy to give your heart away to someone who's just appealing before you really know that person too well. And if they end up not being a believer, it not only violates God's design for marriage, but it compounds the difficulty 
of merit. But even when we are married as believers, we must honor God's design. God's design for marriage is one man with one woman for a lifetime. God's design for marriage is that two become one, that each be companion to the other, that husbands love their wives with self-chosen self-sacrifice, and that wives honor their husbands with self-chosen respect, and that together they raise offspring in God-aware, God-fearing homes. There's more to it than that, but when any aspect of this design is neglected or transgressed, it not only harms the marriage, but brings disgrace on the God who designed it. And yet Christians do little or no better than the world in keeping the marriage covenant. Pollster George Barna for decades has consistently found that marriages between two believers fare little or no better than marriages between non-believers. Roughly 35% of all those polled who had ever been married have also been divorced. And that's true whether you identify yourself as saved by Jesus or not. Actually, in recent years, the rate among Christians, the rate of divorce among Christians has been higher than the general rate. But Barna points out that much of that difference is because non-Christian couples are no longer getting married. That They often live together outside of marriage. So when they split up, which they do, it doesn't show up in the divorce statistics. Even more disturbing, though, Barney has asked if, apart from adultery and abandonment, divorce should be thought of as a sin. More than half of professing followers of Jesus said it was not a sin. In my opinion, this is where the slippery slope of failed Western sexual ethics took hold. When the church stopped taking divorce and broken marriages seriously and gave in to the culture's pressure many decades ago now. And I believe God feels that way about it as well. We see God's heart clearly in Malachi 2, 13 and 14. Faithfulness in marriage, God says, honors the purposes of his covenant. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. In addition to the problem of marrying outside the faith, Malachi's heroes had the same problem that's rampant in our culture. They were getting divorces for no reason. As a result, God was not pleased with their sacrifices and was not answering their prayers. He was acting as a witness and a judge on behalf of the wife of your youth. God sees, Malachi says, that you have broken faith. There's another use of that word. You have uncovered, you have uncovenant, you have left unprotected this wife who you were supposed to be committed to. So in the context... The men of Malachi's day had probably divorced their Jewish wives and moved on to wives from the surrounding nations. But in our day, many are still guilty of abandoning their first or even their second wives for younger or somehow more appealing marriages. But notice that the verses also have very positive things to say about what marriage is supposed to be. Verse 14 says, you have been faithless, Though she is your companion, the word companion or partner is most often used of joining things or uniting things in the Hebrew. Objects were joined together. For example, the tabernacle curtains or the shoulder pieces of the priest's garments. In the same way, men were joined together in political and military activities. And the word can also refer to a very close bond between people, as in the close relationship between Daniel and his three friends. So it's a great word, this word companion. And scripture supports the idea that marriage is for the joining together of two persons for mutual help and companionship. If you go back to God's establishment of marriage in Genesis 2, it says, It is not good for the man to be alone. 
I will make a helper, a companion, suitable for him. Companionship, mutual help. These are still key to successful marriage today. It's so easy for couples to grow apart. If they isolate their responsibilities, isolate their interests. Companionship means the intentional holding of things in common, the intentional doing of life together. Doing things together from recreation to household repairs to ministry. It's the intentional living of married life in a how can I spend time with you way. In a how can I help you way. As we reinforce companionship and partnership, we strengthen our marriages. The second word verse 14 uses to describe marriage is covenant. She is the wife of your marriage covenant. A covenant is the solemn agreement between two parties. It can be used of agreement or contract between individuals or between tribes or nations. And in any covenant, God in that day was solemnly called to be the witness to the transaction so that all of these would be considered covenants of their Lord. But there are also covenants where God was one of the parties in the covenant and a witness to the covenant at the same time. So these God covenants spell out his promises and blessings to his people. So God promises Noah after the flood that he won't send the rain again. It's a covenant. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with the nation of Israel and Moses at Sinai. He made a covenant later with David. Okay, so in the same as all of those, Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It's a solemn agreement made by oath with God as the witness and with the purpose of eternal commitment to each other. Covenants are always eternal. Marriage is called a covenant a couple places other than this. In Proverbs 17, Proverbs 2.17 rather, where the adulterous wife is said to have ignored the marriage covenant. Ezekiel 16.8, great passage, uh, talking about God's marriage covenant with Israel. And just as a covenant marriage calls for covenant loyalty for he- or hesed by both sides, so also covenant marriage has an irrevocable nature. If you and I see our marriages as covenants, not just contracts, we'll be committed to loyalty to our companion, and will be committed till death do us part. God's design for marriage is to bring into being a companionship that is protected by the walls of covenant commitment. There are no trial marriages in Scripture. There is no living together in Scripture, even though today it's almost considered the norm. Now, this is committed, and that commitment is what helps make the relationship work. It admits to no dissolution. It admits to no way out. It's forever. So verse 15 is a transition verse. The first half belongs to this first point that we're making now, that to be faithful is to honor God's covenant purposes for marriage. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. This turns out to be a very difficult verse in Hebrew, very difficult to translate. If you line up several good translations, you'll see fairly significant differences. So the translation we normally use, the English Standard Version, gets it pretty close to the intent, I believe. God made them one. Again, this goes back to Genesis, where God says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God's design for marriage is that two people so fully give themselves to each other that they become one. One of my favorite practical terms for this is usness. It's what we are together, a new entity that is made up of the husband and the wife, but is more than either of them alone. I believe this marriage covenant is not just witnessed by God, not just sanctioned by God, but that God does a supernatural work, a miracle, in every marriage. And unfortunately, many people don't have eyes to see that God has made them one. How? 
Malachi says it's through a portion of the Spirit in their union. The literal, literal reading would be a residue of the Spirit. Oneness is a supernatural work that God does through the Holy Spirit in every marriage. There's a spiritual component to it, a work of the Spirit that is not visible and yet is real. Thus, the marriage relationship is much more than physical. It is physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And those of you who've done premarital counseling with me will know that I do this a hundred times over the course of our time together. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. It is God-ordained. It is God-accomplished. And the responsibility of marriage partners is to be what God has made them, one flesh, in their daily practice of marriage as well as in this underlying reality. And Malachi, moving quickly, says, okay, so why is this? So that they can produce godly offspring. Children born outside this covenant commitment and God-ordained unity are missing the tremendous blessings of godly marriage and family, and especially in Old Testament times, on being part of God's chosen line. In our culture, the number of children who've gone through divorce or whose parents were never married has utterly skyrocketed, and we've seen the impacts. We know the contrast in positive outcomes between children with two parent families and any other kind of family. Now, it's not true in every case, of course, and thank God for his grace, but in general, children of one parent or unmarried families just don't do as well. The second half of verse 15 begins our final section where we see our responsibility to heed God's covenant commands. For this section, I'm going to read from the New International Version, which does a slightly better job on the difficult Hebrew of these verses. NIV says, So, guard yourself in your spirit, and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garments, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. This is the plain application for every married person in this room of this text. If you want to honor God and his covenant design, keep a close eye on yourself and don't break faith with your partner. Now notice it's a spiritual issue. Disloyalty and unfaithfulness in marriage springs from a spiritual source. That source is our fallen sinful nature. Faithfulness and covenant loyalty in marriage also spring from a spiritual source. God as I've said to many couples planning to get married, if you can't, you can't do this on your own. You have to depend on God for the strength, wisdom, and will to persevere in marriage. Everything we've seen so far about God's attitude toward marriage leads us to the conclusion that faithfulness in marriage is intimately linked to our faithfulness to God. So when God tells us to guard our spirits, he's telling us to guard ourselves, to guard our hearts spiritually, to be careful to have a soft heart toward God that recognizes our sins, confesses them, turns from them, and that recognizes when temptation comes and flees to him. At the same time, we need to have a soft heart toward our spouse, a heart of compassion, not condemnation, a heart of forgiveness, not bitterness, a heart of gentleness, and not anger. Self-examination, examining your own heart, is key to this area. Are you hard-hearted or are you soft-hearted? Are you hard-hearted or soft-hearted toward God? How about towards your spouse? Are, are you vulnerable and open to conviction and to compassion? Contrary to what the world seems to teach, it's only the soft-hearted that survive. That's God's heart toward us and our heart in marriage. And yet, verse 16, God says, I hate divorce. 
says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with a garment, says the Lord God Almighty. God, God says he, he hates all this that's going on in our culture. Kaiser calls this one of the strongest protests anywhere in Scripture against divorce. God is said in no uncertain terms to loathe the practice and its results. Now, some would come back and say, well, God allowed divorce in Deuteronomy 24. But Jesus says that God wasn't condoning divorce. He was regulating it due to the hardness of people's hearts. Jesus says that God made man and women, men and women, for this one flesh relationship. And anyone who divorces, except in the case of adultery, is doing what adultery does, tearing apart the oneness of marriage. If we're going to have God's heart about marriage, then we have to see every divorce as a tragedy. I know some are here this morning or listening on the live stream who have been divorced. I'm not saying at all that God can't provide healing and help, that he can't protect you or your children, that he can't bring good from what's happened. But it's not God's design. He designed marriage for human flourishing. And anything less than that is a consequence of the fall and of human sin. If you look at divorces, maybe your own, maybe other people's, you always find that the situation was a mess. That immaturity, selfishness, and brokenness, and believing the lies of the enemy had everything to do with the divorce, and that hearts needed to change, that hearts have to change even now. Because if you're in a messy marriage, that's dangerous. The anger that builds up can easily lead to abuse and violence. I mean, look at what God says here. I hate divorce, and I hate a man covering himself with violence as well as with his garment. Now, notice the recurrence of the garment there. Instead of protecting others with the covenant garment, as Boaz did Ruth, this person has wrenched the garment away and by violence and anger protects only himself instead of his family. That's sick. Divorce is tragic, but marriages characterized by violence are also tragic. So does that mean that God would sanction divorce in cases of abuse? Some pastors and counselors would say yes. 20 years ago, I would have uh, completely said no. And, and even now, I would always push for temporary separation as a way of protecting families from violence, combined with earnest counsel and prayer that God would allow both the husband and the wife to have a soft heart, to, to change the violence and hatred to love and loyalty and commitment. That, that's, that's the ideal, even in such a broken case. But on a case-by-case -case basis, partially because of this verse, partially because of some recent analysis of the abandonment clause that you may have heard of in 1 Corinthians 7, I'm ready to at least consider considering divorce in cases of extreme abuse. I think that's what this verse points at. Malachi closes the section by repeating his summary command. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Faithfulness in marriage honors God's covenant design. When we deal treacherously in our marriages by divorce, by violence, by anger, by disloyalty, or even by the simple loss of companionship, we break faith with God's design. And, and the, the key thing is that these are spiritual issues. Two people alone cannot deal with them. These issues have to be resolved through utter dependence on God who helps us. So I can't think of a Christian I know with a really healthy marriage who doesn't also have a really healthy relationship with God. The two things go hand in hand. So if you want to be closer to God, one way is to work on integrity in your marriage. But if you want to be closer to your husband or your wife, Work on an honest and vulnerable and growing relationship with God. 
So we began this message by describing the downfall of Murray and Becky Conrad's marriage. So let's uh, tell the rest of that story. When we last left it, Murray had resigned his job in Dallas and he'd moved to Tulsa. He moved in with his mom, who it happened was a strong believer, and that process, through her, brought him to a place of repentance over his failure in the marriage. He began to seek God's guidance. He began even to attend Bible school in Tulsa so that he could rebuild the foundation of his life on God's word. And then at this Christmas thing, God unexpectedly guided him to send this picture with Santa Claus. I mean, he thought he was crazy, but he he purchased a gold chain as a gift. He put it in an envelope along with that picture, and he dropped it in the mailbox, wondering what Becky's reaction would be. Three days later, his first communication from Becky since the divorce came in, and it was a Christmas card. He opened it up, and to his astonishment, inside was a picture of Becky sitting on Santa's knee. She'd done the same thing he had. She'd been led the same way he had. And so then she gets his card. She calls him up. She can't believe that they both had their pictures taken with Santa. So they go along. February 2nd is their wedding anniversary, and that they agreed that they weren't going to just meet. They were going to meet halfway between Dallas and Tulsa just to spend the anniversary together and see what God was doing. So they spent several hours together that day, having a meal, talking, laughing, and even praying together. So then Becky sent him another letter. She'd seen the change. She'd seen the change from an angry young man to someone who was pursuing God. And Murray was just utterly grateful that he had been renewing his mind in the Word of God, stripping away hostility, stripping away defensiveness through his relationship with the Lord. So they continued to communicate, and they began to pray together that they would hear and recognize God's perfect will for their lives. Becky especially asked God to show them in a big way so that they wouldn't miss it. But Murray, he went to his pastor And they prayed together for God's direction. Was it time to return to the marriage, return to Dallas? And the pastor said, well, yeah. Reconciliation is always God's idea. So he wanted to go back to Dallas. He didn't have a job. Becky was praying for a big thing. And three days later, Murray's former boss called. And I wanted to know if he would return to work to his job in Dallas, but not to his old job, to the job of a division manager. So I went back. Seven months after the divorce, Murray and Becky were remarried. God can heal. God can heal anything broken. But true wisdom for us who are married, or even those not married in this room, is to learn from other people's mistakes. So cherish your spouse. Seek companionship with him or with her. Become one, guard your spirit, and do not break faith.